So hi again and welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this Tuesday for our webinar on whale acoustics presented by the CTEC team of student researchers, alumni of the program, mentors, and really an overall incredible team of researchers and science outreach experts that we have with us today. Um, I am Victoria Herman. I am one of the leaders of the Migration in Harmony Research Coordination Network, which is a National Science Foundation funded network that brings all of you together to discuss how the Arctic is changing and what we could do to cooperate and collaborate on answering research questions for a more equitable, just, and sustainable Arctic in motion. I'll be sharing a link for all of you to join this network and hopefully join us in Anchorage, Alaska next year for our first in-person meeting, uh, pandemic pending. But for now, I would ask that all of you please mute yourselves during this 30 minute presentation. We'll hear from um, a team of presenters who will introduce themselves and then present their research and their experience in science-based education and mentorship. I'll be looking at the chat box, so if you have any questions throughout this presentation, please type them in and I will be collecting those um, and we will open it up for an hour of question and answer afterwards to have a really rich discussion. Um, so please uh, put your full attention to this incredible team of CTEC student and alumni and mentor researchers. And Anne, I'm going to hand it over to you. Awesome, thank you so much, Victoria. I'm gonna start sharing my screen here. Um, so my name is Anne Simonis. I am an acoustic ecologist with NOAA Fisheries and I've been working with the CTEC program since 2016. Um, and um, first of all, I just want to thank all of you for joining and for your attention today. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about this program, which I think is really an exceptional opportunity for students to work with active researchers. It's um, a collaboration between the Whale Acoustics Lab at Scripps Institution of Oceanography and um, Mount Edgecombe High School in Sitka, Alaska. And in this program, we have high school students who are con conducting authentic research uh, with a range of mentors. It could be staff or faculty researchers, um, graduate students like Natalie Postalgian. She's a, a graduate student at Scripps studying the Gulf of Alaska sperm whales. Um, she's in the audience, I think, today. Um, we also have undergrads who help us mentor these students. Some of our undergrads used to be CTEC students themselves. Um, and in our research, we're using acoustic recordings to study marine mammals um, and human activities. You know, these acoustic recordings allow us to, to study these animals or ecosystems that otherwise might be difficult or downright impossible to observe visually. Um, and first of all, right off the bat, I want to acknowledge some of our, our biggest champions uh, of CTEC. Um, John Hildebrand at the Scripps Whale Acoustics Lab, who I also think I saw in here today, um, has been really generous in providing his extensive library of acoustic recordings for the students to analyze. And, um, and then we also have um, a lot of support from Professor Bob Rex over the years, um, who has provided support to bring their students down to San Diego to present their results at the end of the year. Um, and so I just wanted to acknowledge them and thank them right away from the get-go. Um, so today I'm, I'm joined um, by the CTEC founder, Josh Jones, and um, he's an Arctic researcher finishing up his PhD at Scripps. And also our, our friend and dedicated partner, Mr. Michael Mahoney, who's a teacher at Mount Edgecombe High School. Um, we also have four alumni spanning over uh, a decade of, I think it's like 12 years of participation in the CTEC program. So we have Amaya Edwards, Doreen Levitt, uh, Ian Sia, Chachi, um, and Tessa Baldwin. And each of them have a really interesting experience and perspective with the CTEC program. So I, want, I really want them to, 
to tell you about um, their experience shortly. Um, so I mentioned when I first joined CTEC, I was a grad student at Scripps um, in 2016. But now um, I've left San Diego and I'm living in Oakland, California. It's my home base where I work as a contractor with NOAA Fisheries. Um, but but uh, Mr. Mahoney and the students are in Sitka, Alaska at Mount Edgecombe High School, which means that most of our interactions are um, virtual. They've been online through Skype meetings. And we've been doing this uh, long before COVID came along. Um, so, Mr. Mahoney provides a lot of support from within the classroom environment. Um, the students have an option of, of having a, a four credit class or an independent study to participate in the program. Um, but the researchers, the mentors, are meeting with the students weekly, um, through, usually through Skype, and we're training the students to access the primary literature and to, we train them to analyze acoustic data. And they can learn to recognize sounds of marine mammals or human sounds in the environment. Um, and, and then the mentors over the course of a semester or multiple years, depending on the student, um, will supervise their progress as they analyze a novel acoustic data set and, and produce really meaningful results. Uh, at the end of the spring semester, the day after the students uh, the students last day of school, they board a plane and fly down to San Diego in normal years. This year we couldn't do it because of COVID, but, um, but the culmination of their research project is a symposium where the students uh, work intensely to put together conference style talks and then they present these talks to an academic audience at the university. Um, it's a lot of work, but it's also a lot of fun. Um, and while they're in San Diego, we also make time to get the students to explore the university campus. We usually tour a variety of different labs and the students get to interact with um, other student groups on, on campus. Um, and, and we also make time just to celebrate and have fun because at this point the students have worked really hard and, um, and it's just something fun to celebrate. So we'll make time to do a beach barbecue. Uh, we usually get out on the water for a whale watching trip. Sometimes we collect acoustic data while we're out there. Um, it's just this week is a, a wonderful culmination and time to celebrate and actually enjoy in normal years being together after a, a semester of virtual interaction. And, um, and so I think I, I love participating in this because it's, it's a chance for me to see students develop in, develop their research skills and confidence in presenting. Um, and I also get to do a lot more research than I would ever get to do on my own. Um, and, and beyond that, we know that you know, there's a huge and growing body of, of evidence that positive mentorship can make a real difference um, for students uh, who might be interested in pursuing careers in STEM. You know, particularly for students from backgrounds that are traditionally underrepresented in STEM. Um, but, but these mentorship opportunities don't just um, happen on their own. You know, it takes a lot of planning and evaluation and adjustments along the way. Um, and so my hope is that by bringing everyone together from the CTEC team today, we might inspire some of you to connect with your local teachers or your local researchers and start to develop relationships to provide similar opportunities to students. So I'm gonna invite Josh Jones to tell you a little bit about how he got CTEC off the ground right now. And then we'll have Mr. Mahoney and the students um, tell you about the research. Okay, um, thanks Anne. I'm Josh Jones, and I'm a graduate student at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography. I work for John Hildebrand in the Whale Acoustics Laboratory at Scripps. Um, we started this project, this is like 16 years ago now, um, with the help of the Ocean Institute in Dana Point, California. It's an informal science education facility. And the Ocean Institute, actually, this was Harry Helling, who's now the director of the Birch Aquarium at Scripps, came to us in our lab um, with an idea to um, put a proposal into an NSF program called ITEST, which if I search my memory, I think was the Institute for, oh no, 
um, innovative technology education, no experiences for students and teachers, I test, yeah. And um, so we, along with Ocean Institute, applied and um, got a grant from NSF for three years to see if we could develop um, collaborations between an informal science education facility, Ocean Institute, um, an academic research and, and an education um, a group like University of California, San Diego, and high school teachers, and actually do some science and see if we can give students a breadth of exposure to marine science generally. And so throughout that three years, um, and with a lot of help from Ocean Institute, we became hooked in our lab on sharing opportunities for young people to get involved with our research. Um, we would had a lot of success with that and found that um, high school students were just as capable as uh, we graduate students and, um, and had a lot of potential to contribute meaningfully to the research that we were doing. So at the end of that um, iTest grant, this would have been 2007, 2008, um, we had a huge stroke of luck. Um, a friend of mine who is a teacher at Mount Edgecombe High School in Sick, Alaska, a guy named Paul Fitzgibbon, who's a social science teacher, he, uh, on the phone, he said, you know what, you need to meet the best science teacher in the whole wide world. He's here at Mount Edgecombe. His name is Michael Mahoney. But let me put you on the phone with him. And, um, and Michael and I started talking, and what we found is that we both had the same kind of um, passion for sharing. Michael for sharing science with his students and participating in science and the same for us. And so, um, so with the help of Hildebrand, our boss, um, and the support from Mount Edgecombe on Mr. Mahoney's side, we just in earnest tried to keep this CTEC program going and really focus on what we love the most, which was the actual research internship aspect. We thought we could really, really dig in and do some science together. Um, and so I'm not going to take a lot of time. I really want to, um, Mr. Mahoney and the students to be able to talk about this. Um, but, but the one thing that I would, I, I guess I would share most importantly is that, um, like Ann said, we've been able to do a lot of science with high school students. Um, I think the research that we've done in the Whale Acoustics Lab has really been um, bolstered by the work of these students, and some of whom have, you'll meet have continued on doing marine science and whale acoustics into their careers now. Um, but, the, but the main thing, I think, is, is that what we've, we've, we've found that relationships between their long-term relationships, basically we just agree Mahoney agrees, hey, any scientist who wants to be a part of my life and a part of my classroom is welcome to be a part of that family for as long as you want to do it. And we feel the same way. And so now it's 10 years later and we've been able to work with, I think we counted over 100 uh, research internships uh, from Mount Edgecombe students from lots of communities over uh, Alaska. And this all kind of centers around this one special science teacher and then a few some researchers who are um, excited about, about working with them and his students, um, like Anne, you know, worked with Mr. Mahoney as a graduate student and with his students, and now has taken working with Mr. Mahoney and CTEC to NOAA. And Natalie, who's a graduate student now in our lab, uh, working on sperm whales, and now all of a sudden there are students at Mount Edgecombe who are doing research on uh, marine mammals in the Gulf of Alaska. I work in the Arctic, and I've had multiple students working with me on the Arctic. And um, but you look at that that program, and you see there's one really special ingredient, and that's this science teacher who I'm really <laughs> pleased to introduce you to. Um, his name is Michael Mahoney. He's my favorite teacher and one of my very very good friends. And um, I, I can't recommend enough for anyone who's listening and interested in a program like this. Josh, we just lost you. We just, you just got muted accidentally, I think. There you go. Oh yeah. Recommendation, find yourself a special teacher, find yourself an informal science education or someplace, a facility or someplace you can share the outdoors with children and just, um, and just see what you can do and uh, keep at it. So with that, I'll introduce uh, Mr. Mahoney uh, at Mount Edgecombe. Thanks. Uh, thank you so much, Josh. Um, it's, it's, it, it's a special treat to be able to work with Ann and Josh and all of the researchers that we've been able to work with. And, and thank you to Professor Rex and uh, Dr. Hildebrand at, at UCSD there. They've been huge 
uh, supporters of the program. Uh, really quickly, just a little bit about Mount Edgecombe High School. We are a, a very unique school. Uh, we are a state-funded public boarding school of about 400 students uh, from over 100 different uh, locations in the state of Alaska. And so we fly the students in in August and they stay with us until May. Uh, we're about 90% Alaska Native. And, uh, and, and so with, with this special school, we also uh, have a, a wonderful administration that's willing to let teachers like myself uh, take on passion classes and, and do some things that are a little different. Uh, CTEC doesn't, doesn't necessarily fall into your normal curriculum for science uh, education for you know, state standards and things of that nature. But uh, the difference between this class and, and regular classroom, uh, the regular classroom experience for me and something that, that I really, really uh, hold dear is that uh, for, for many years in my career, I, I like to give students experiences outside of the classroom. I like to give them exposure to, to professionals in, in different career avenues. And so I would bring a number of people into my classroom and they would, they would stand in front of the class and give a presentation about how if you go to school for a really long time uh, and you work really hard, then you can do the thing that I do. And uh, Dr. Hildebrand and Josh Jones were, were so different. They came into my classroom and said, I'd like to invite you into this world that we have and we'd like you to participate and be, and be researchers with us. And for me as a science teacher to be able to work with uh, scripts uh, was just a super special treat. And uh, my students were very excited and uh, it, it's been a, a, a lot of fun giving students an experience where they're uh, participating in, in learning something new about the world. And, and one of our goals with this uh, is to help students connect with these, with these marine mammals, these animals that, that are both subsistence and culturally valuable to them, uh, and, and to learn as much as they can and to be able to share this information both with the scientific community but also their communities at home. Um, we had a, a young man that was an intern a few years ago, and we had them talking about, you know, why did you choose your specific marine mammal to, to study this year in SeaTac? And he said, well, I, I chose bearded seals because that's the animal that I kill the most and eat. So <laughs> we, thought that was, we thought that was fun. Um, we also think that, that, you know, creating memories and fostering a love of science is something that's, that's really important. It's more important than memorizing the, the formula for photosynthesis, which you, know, you may or may not remember, but you will remember building a hydrophone and going out on a boat and, and doing all these things and creating networks with, with other researchers and scientists that can help you to advance into college and get a career later on. And uh, we think that that's really important here at Mount Edgecombe is to try to provide those experiences uh, and, and help our students to, to continue on. And so uh, with that, uh, I, I'd like, you know, Anne, it'd be great if you could introduce some of our interns and uh, let's get started because nobody wants to hear me. <laughs> sure thing. I'm just going to share this, my screen again. Can you see, can you see that? Awesome. Um, so yeah, this is just our chance to sort of give you CTEC by the numbers. Uh, we've already told you a little bit about this. You know, it's been going for over a decade. We have about 100 interns from over 53 communities, because remember, they're coming from all these different remote villages and towns throughout Alaska. Um, even a couple students from China. Um, students have had 15 poster presentations at the Alaska Marine Science Symposium. Uh, we even have co-authors on papers. Um, so we have had a couple um, publications come out where the students are our co-authors. So it's pretty awesome to graduate high school and already have a, a publication to your name. Okay, so enough of me. So now I'm going to introduce you to Amaya Edwards. She is a recent graduate from Mount Edgecombe. She was part of the CTEC class this last year. They had, um, you know, an extra special experience with their semester being interrupted by the pandemic. So I'm gonna let Amaya tell you about um, her experience and some of the research that we were able to do. Okay, Amaya. Yeah, um, hi everybody. Uh, it did suck not getting to um, go on the fabulous trip that was you know, talked about all year, 
But aside from all that, it was still really fun and enriching. But yes, my name is Amaya Edwards Davis, and I am a recent graduate from my Mount Edgecombe High School. Um, I grew up in Barrow, Alaska, and so watching my town members go sub subsistence hunting made me interested in life under the water. And so when they would pull up the whales and other marine life, it really did spark my interest. So it was super cool getting the opportunity to do a class like SeaTech, which wasn't offered at Barrow High School. Um, this year, me, myself, and 10 others took part of looking at the echolocation clicks of different marine mammals in the Gulf of Alaska. So moving on to the next slide. As a class, we went through data collected from two different sites in the Gulf of Alaska, site CB and KOA. The instrument used was called a high frequency acoustic recording package or also known as a harp. Many sounds we recorded were whale clicks, explosions, anthropogenic sounds and ambient noises. So yeah, we had a lot to go through. So when we would listen to these animals, we were also able to see the different noises through a program called Triton. In this program, we were able to look at spectrograms, which was a tool to help us visualize the sound. And on the spectrogram, which on the slide you can see, it's circled. There's the first, the first little box and it's circled. That's a click. And um, based off of the species inner click interval, the peak frequencies and click size, we were able to identif and identify the species by looking at the clicks. We know based on literature that the identification methods that we used were reliable. So it's pretty cool. Next slide, you are looking at a 24 hour plot. It is just one of many examples that was used in our research project that we um, did. So if you would like to watch the rest of it, it is on YouTube, <laughs> the full webinar. Moving on to our conclusions, we found that throughout our collected data, we could confirm that five different odontoses were detected, which were killer whales, sperm whales, cyanogers, and Baird's beak whales, and Rizzo's dolphins. And with that information, we also concluded that on site CB, there were more od odontoseid activity overall. In general, the killer, whales act the killer whales activity peaked during the summer and beaked whales showed a fluctuation in habitat use. And lastly, there was an unexpected presence of Rizzo's dolphins and they were mainly de detected at nighttime. So we found a lot of things and it was super cool, but also very confusing at times because no matter how many ways we could figure out a specific species, you never really could know until, I don't know, until you had Mr. Mahoney tell you. <laughs> so that was really nice. But yeah, overall, it was a really good year. It was frustrating because of the cut short time that we had, but it was, I really enjoyed my time in Sea Tech. Yeah, that's it. Awesome. Thanks, Amaya. Yeah. Yay. Okay. Yeah. So, as she mentioned, the, all the students, um, a complete coverage of their research should be available on a, a YouTube link. We're just going to give you a little teaser here. Um, so next, um, I want to invite Doreen to, to talk. She is our next most recent graduate um, who's gone on to do other research, um, some with the Royal Acoustics Lab and other places. So Doreen, if you're ready, I'll let you take it away. Hello. So my name is Doreen Levitt, and I was a CTEC intern for two years from 2016 to 2018. In my first year focused on the acoustic presence of blue whales on the Truckee Sea, north of Point Barrow, where, where I'm from. Um, as a second year intern, I worked on beluga whistle repertoire in the central Canadian Arctic, south of Resolute Bay. And after high school, I continued to work on beluga, beluga acoustics for two years going into my third year um, as an undergraduate research with the North Slope Board from the Wildlife Management in Barrow. Um, and in the summer of 2019, I got the amazing opportunity to be a part of Scripps' Undergraduate Research Fellowship, which is a 10-week program that allows graduates um, from around the U.S., usually from under underrepresented groups, get real research experience. Um, and this is where I really got to dive deep in the Beluga Whistle research. Um, and now I can continue marine mammal acoustics with Rutgers University. Uh, through an REU with Ari Friedlander, Carolyn Casey, and Celine Fergusi. 
um, focusing on dolphin whistles and how they respond to Navy sonar in Southern California. So moving forward, I could safely say that SeaTac definitely opened a, opened up a world of opportunities for me. Without it, I probably wouldn't have any idea of what my summers would be filled with or know what I want to study going into grad school because eventually I want to, this is what I want to do with a PhD or a master's. Yeah. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Doreen. Um, and Doreen, I think, is, is one of our exceptions who's, you know, really diving deep into the marine science and the whale acoustics following her experience with SeaTech. Um, when we start this, we don't ex expect every student to, to become uh, an expert in whale acoustics and follow a career in marine science. We really just hope that students um, get comfortable with the science and understand how to use science in their life. Um, but yeah, we're really excited to, to see where Doreen goes with this. Okay, next, um, let's hear from Tessa, Tessa Baldwin. Yeah, oofla lotuk, everyone. My name is Tessa Baldwin. I am from Kotzebue, Alaska, which um, for those of you who are not from Alaska, um, it's about 30 miles above the Arctic Circle. Um, and I actually graduated from Mount Edgecombe High School in 2012, so quite a while ago, but um, I also went on to study at UC San Diego, and I think that's um, kind of where the bridge is between um, my, <laughs> my work in Kotzebue and uh, with SeaTech because um, I'm actually a behavioral health therapist, so I analyze humans now and no longer do the acoustic work. <laughs> um, but I, I guess I really just want to speak on the opportunity that um, SeaTech and Managed come along with Scripps had provided me um, as a young teenager going on into college because I grew up in a small community in rural Alaska where I honestly didn't really truly see myself in in college or really going to school to further my education. But um, for the three years that I was a CTEC intern, I was able to go to California and visit the university and be able to, you know, actually picture myself at a school that was outside of Alaska and be able to have already that like built in mentorship with Josh and um, you know, the connection with Mr. Mahoney every year so that, and with Ian, because we also went to UC San Diego together. So I think, you know, those already built in relationships really fostered me to be able to succeed in an undergraduate career. And I think that's something that I, I truly owe a lot to CTEC and being able to continue on um, to support this program is something that I'm very, um, proud to continue to do because I think, you know, being able to provide these opportunities to young Alaska Native students um, and, and others alike um, is something more meaningful um, to be able to, um, you know, build our communities up and be able to ensure that our students have these opportunities as well. Um, so with that said, I would just like to thank you for allowing me to come in and say hi and speak a little bit on we have a program that has truly grown throughout the years. Um, it's been quite amazing to see it grow. I actually did a um, talk at the Alaska Marine Science Symposium in front of hundreds, <laughs> hundreds of scientists um, when I was a teenager, and that was one of the most frightful things that I've ever done, but one of the most, uh, something that I'm still really um, proud to say happened. So thank you for the opportunity for allowing me to share my experience. Awesome. Thank you so much, Tessa. Yeah, that it's so cool to hear your story. And it's been so great to have um, people like Tessa and Doreen come back and talk to our current students. Um, it's, yeah, it's fun to make these connections. Okay, so lastly, we're going to hear from Ian Sia, who is, I think, the, the original They're really uh, good to be there. So that's uh, a student, Mr. Mahoney. So Ian, you can go ahead and take it away. And if, yep, there we go. Someone had their mic. Okay. Hello, everybody. I'm Ian Sia. Can everybody hear me? Okay. Uh, yeah, I was part of the original group, um, the, the first round of SeaTech interns. So in high school, I did research with SeaTech for two years, and that inspired me to go down to San Diego to continue working with the Whale Acoustics Lab in, throughout college in my undergraduate uh, career. And yeah, you know, working with all of the 
Um, oh yeah, also I'm originally from Bethel, Alaska. So yeah, after, after going to San Diego, um, you know, they, they took me out on a boat and I got to work with all of the crazy equipment they use to, you know, re record these marine calls. And it really inspired me to uh, go into mechanical engineering. So that, that's what I decided to do throughout my undergraduate. And then throughout all of my experience working at the Whale Acoustics Lab, it really set me up to move into a career in uh, RF communication and so that, that's what I'm currently doing now. And yeah, this, this program like completely changed my life because, you know, uh, it really pushed me to go into science and engineering and really to foster, you know, all of the you know, interest I had in those fields. So yeah, yeah, thank you so much for, for all this. It's truly an amazing program. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so, and, and I, I would echo that. It's, you know, I think CTEC has changed my life as well. Um, we all really care about it, which is why we're here today. Um, so thank you all to the alumni for, for coming in. And, and now I think we, we'd love to open it up for some discussion with the rest of you um, to talk about the actual whale acoustics or developing the program or the students. I mean, they have um, a whole, lots of experience. I'm sure they'd be happy to share with you. Great, thank you so much to all of the presenters. Uh, if everyone can join me in giving first a huge virtual round of applause for those presentations. Um, I think I heard the word life-changing more times in this presentation that I have uh, in recent memory. And I think that is a testament to every single person that has presented. Um, so we are going to open it up now to questions um, and see we have a few that have already come in. Um, we do have one question that I think we will ask first. Um, Ann Robertson, are you on the call? Um, and could you unmute yourself if you're on the call? Hi, can you hear me? This is Anne. Yes, we can hear you. Hi, Anne, this is Lisa. Oh, hey. <laughs> All right, so I think our first question is coming from Senator Lisa Murkowski, who is going to ask the students uh, a question about their research. Senator Murkowski? Well, thank you for the opportunity to, to ask a question. And, and before I, I do, I just, I want to thank you for the opportunity to, to be able to dial in and hear about this experience and how it has uh, really supported studies and, and guided uh, your careers. I think we recognize that in Alaska, we've got some, some pretty unique opportunities for hands-on uh, learning about marine science. And so what you're doing, how you're doing it is is, is very, very important. I just want to encourage that. Um, the, the, the benefits for the student research opportunities like CTEC, um, I think not only are, are, are significant in how they're able to focus young people, uh, getting um, young Alaskans interested in STEM programs. Uh, as we know, um, the, the significance from us from a resource uh, perspective is is pretty incredible and then when you introduce the element that um, that can be brought with traditional knowledge um, from our Alaska Native students uh, again just just good strong opportunities there so without without going further into the, just my thanks um, uh, for for what you're doing and how you're doing it uh, what I what I'm curious about and and this was this is probably directed to to some of our students who are um, from whaling families that that come from Utiavik is is how you were able to incorporate your own traditional knowledge or your subsistence experience into the research that you did with CTEC. This is something that I'm trying to do more from a federal policy initiative. 
perspective is, is work to figure out how we can do a better job of incorporating traditional knowledge into some of, of the very significant research that we have going on uh, in the Arctic uh, with our oceans. So if anybody would like to reply to that, I'd, I'd certainly welcome that. Um, I guess I'll do it. <laughs> you can go back. Um, my whole thing is, is that I really did not get a chance to be a part of that, which I feel very upset about. But at the same time, understanding I did grow up in Barrow, but I wasn't really pushed or enriched in that culture. But from an outsider's point of view, someone who did grow up there and learned to respect their values, I think going into SeaTech, it was very important for me to not just see it as animals but as a community as life underneath water and kind of just take that knowledge of knowing to respect animals even though they are food <laughs> but to also um take that with me when i'm in sea tech so that's all i can really give to that question but their traditional values is something i i really can't speak for so yeah appreciate one. that doreen would you want to chime in at all as well yeah so i actually come from a whaling family so joining SeaTech and incorporating the knowledge that I learned from the class into my community, it was, it was hard for me to understand at first. So I didn't really, I couldn't really bridge the gap in the beginning. Um, but I feel like now using acoustics and, and using that for the community would be super helpful with using quotas like going to um, IWC or AEWC. I know that they use a lot of the data um, to fill the quota. So like we have a spring and a fall whaling season um, and it's both very different. And also using my work now with the Navy sonar and how dolphins react to human made noise will also be very important because I know shipping is becoming a more common thing in the Arctic. So that would be really cool to, to study also. Can I just, uh, I wanted to um, thank you, Doreen, for answering that. I was really hoping that you would. And I, I wanna make sure, um, Tessa, if you, I know you've given this a lot of thought um, and, and being from Kotzebue and, um, kind of the role that you've taken in your community in life. I just want to make sure that you get a chance to um, answer if you have any response to uh, Senator Murkowski's question. I do, and I just want to first thank you, Senator Murkowski, for taking the time to um, be with us today. I know that you have a pretty busy schedule, so it means a lot for us um, for you to listen in. Um, so I, I remember being a high school student, it wasn't that long ago, I don't know, 10 years ago, <laughs> but um, at the time I had remembered one of the most meaningful things was actually presenting at the Alaska Marine Science Symposium and being able to have a talk because I was able to talk about um, our well-being as Native people really relying on these, anim um, these marine mammals that we're studying as young students, as high school students. Um, you know, our spirituality is really tied to, although Kotzebue is not a whaling community, um, we were traditionally tied to Utkiavik and traditionally tied with trading. And I think that's something that was really cool to me and outs was really spoken to me about um, being able to study something that I found so spiritual and I found so um, meaningful in my life. And I think that was something that really tie tied me and <laughs> made me want to continue on with this program. Um, as a young Indyback student. So I, I think that question is a very deep one. And I also think it, it's very much needed part of this conversation um, when it comes to science and engaging young Alaska Native students, so. If I just may, I, I really appreciate hearing uh, those, those various perspectives. Um, uh, even uh, as you acknowledge, Doreen, you know, it, it might not have um, uh, been 
been that direct to you, uh, but growing up in in in, in Barrow and and um, just the 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 whaling community that uh, that it is. Uh, well, you might not have been personally uh, involved. You you are immersed uh, in that through through your community. And I I as we have been developing um, a, a what we're calling a um, uh, uh, a new Arctic policy from a legislative perspective, uh, how we incorporate uh, traditional um, knowledge and subsistence experience into federal policy making is something that uh, we really do want to try to um, to incorporate so that this is not just a, a situation where our native, our native people who come with such extraordinary experience, um, as, as, as I have said, you, know, you, you might not find a lot of PhDs um, out in villages, but you will find so many of, of our native elders that have a PhD in living, a PhD in, in observation. And so what they can bring to the table in addition to the scientific data, I think is an extraordinary compliment. If, if I may just quickly ask one more question and this kind of dovetails to all of this. Um, you, it's, 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 it's wonderful to, to hear the, the young uh, voices that are part of, of this uh, program, uh, knowing that you can, um, uh, incorporate back some of what you are are are, are studying. Uh, incorporate it back to your communities. Um, but I guess what I'm curious to know is what you would do if you if you were in my position. If you're a policymaker, how would you use the research that that you are doing and the processes that you're learning with this to inform a decision about um, a development, a prospective development project. Um, say, for instance, a new, uh, a new, a new uh, port there uh, in Kotzebue. We've been talking about the Cape Blossom port for some time, or uh, a, a fishery, or a new government policy. How would you use what you're learning now to um, to to inform policy going forward and it's a pretty broad question but i think it's important or i hope it's important as you are thinking about the value of, of your research and what you are are getting from ctec uh, i'll start out uh, with this question the what this question really reminds me about is uh, I think that there was a very important paper that came out of the whale acoustics lab and they were able to um, locate how far uh, sonic blasts and, and other man-made noise in the Arctic can travel. Uh, so I think using that research, you can, you can really see, you know, how much uh, the, you know, man-made noise can really affect these animals and sometimes it does lead them to committing suicide and beaching themselves up onto shores. And additionally, you know, with the, you know, there, there's so many uh, different spots throughout the Pacific Ocean that, you know, the Whale Acoustic Lab has um, rec recorders, we can really see what their migration routes are. And so maybe being able to, you know, uh, adapt, you know, when, when we're out there and, you know, to, to when the, the whales are out there. And I think it can be very helpful. And, yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, following that, I just would like to say that it's very interesting to me to kind of split my mind into thinking, okay, what would profit the people, but also what would not hurt things that don't really involve myself if that makes sense you know trying to just become less selfless i think is very important because 
through the research that we did through CTEC, we could see that although the man-made things that we are doing profit us as humans, it really does affect life that we aren't really involved in, which, like I said, selflessness is very important. But then again, it's not just about the animals, it's also about the culture of the people up north, the people of Alaska. So on that scale, it makes me just really want to, like you said, it's very broad, <laughs> humanitarian. That's all I can say is that it's very important to realize that where does the profit stop and the, the just being respectful come in, if that makes sense. But yeah, that's all I can say to that. It's just take the facts and know the facts and understand that just because we can say, oh, it doesn't really matter. There'll be more animals. It, that, that's not fair. So yeah, that's all I can Yeah, I could add on um, a little bit. Um, so kind of going back to what Ian was saying, I, um, one thing that I remember vividly um, at my time with CTEC was being able to follow how the ice broke up um, in comparison to our data and the sound. And I remember one specific year that, um, and we would study years in, um, after that this was uh, recorded with the with the harp um, instru instrument. And so I remember this one specific year, um, the ice broke up a little bit faster than normal from what I remember. And um, he, just hearing those stories of people going out hunting and under understanding the way that that impacts um, Alaska Native communities specifically um, is something to really take in consideration with policy because I, like I said, I'm a behavioral health therapist and I now work in my own community um, directly, directly with people who go out hunting. And you know, our subsistence way of life is something that's extremely important to the well-being of our communities. And as we continue to talk about the changes within science, but also the changes within the well-being of Alaska Native communities is directly tied to the science. So I think being able to consider those things together is very important when it comes to policies and um, yeah, so I guess that's what Josh was alluding to a little bit earlier, but thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I I appreciate the uh, I, I appreciate the insight that you're able to share and um, and and really recognizing uh, the value that that the research brings, um, the factual basis uh, that can be used to to inform uh, good policy. Um, uh, it really does matter that we have good science, that we have good data, and, and, and that's why, uh, again, to take it back to what you're doing, um, to, to thank you for, for your focus um, uh, on, the, on the research. And I, I, I also want to acknowledge um, uh, those who have been working as instructors um, for for CTEC, um, I I was told that it's been it's been since 2006, which is just really extraordinary to think how long Mr. Mahoney and and his uh, colleagues there at Scripps um, have given students at Mount Edgecombe the opportunity to do this this research and. Not only, not only for the learning that you gained, um, but for the value going forward. So uh, I, I wanna recognize the, the work of the students, but I also know that uh, it doesn't oftentimes come about unless you've got dedicated um, educators that are really willing to make these happen. So I wanna give, give Mr. Mahoney uh, and, and the others um, uh, a shout out for, for the work that they do. With that, I, I'm gonna have to sign off. My, my days are filled with lots of, of different Zoom calls and teleconferences, and I've got another one that starts here in just now two minutes. But just thank you uh, again for the opportunity to, uh, to, to listen, even, even if it was briefly, and just to thank you for the efforts that you're making. Um, 
the more that we know and understand, uh, certainly about our oceans and our land, uh, better for our planet and better for our people. So thank you for your focus and, and what, you, what you do. I appreciate it. And Anne, thank you for setting this, this, uh, this uh, conference up into this webinar. I appreciate it. Great. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much. Thanks all. Um, and we have hope a, have that you, uh, you use this for science-informed decision-making and how much you champion Arctic policy sustainably and justly in our legislature. So thank you for that and for listening to these young experts and putting that into action. Um, and we look forward to continuing to work with you. I thank you so much. Take care. Be well. Bye, Senator. Um, so while those were all incredible answers from our student experts, we still have lots of other questions that have come in for you to answer. So I'm going to now hand it over to Harsha. Um, if you could unmute yourself and maybe come on video, uh, we have another question um, about your research. Hey, um, I don't know if I want to turn the video on because it's like, 4 a.m. That's, that's okay. No, no. video is required. <laughs> um, so, hey, um, my name is Harsha and um, I am a um, sea lacoustician um, in Australia. And um, I, we have done a few um, interactive programs with the high schoolers here. And what we really um, saw was they picked things up so quickly. So, we introduced um, a bit of coding for them to learn um, to build their coding skills and they came up with really great projects so i was wondering if um, the high schoolers that are enrolled in ctech are given opportunities to do small um, coding projects for example building an automated detector to detect um, the whale vocalizations and um, yeah i think it's it's um, a, a real good opportunity for kids to be involved with um, the program at such a young age. So, yeah. Anne and Natalie are probably the most recent, uh, uh, the recent examples of doing the more sophisticated work with um, Mr. Mahoney's students. You guys have a answer for Harsha? Sure. Yeah, I can. I can pipe in. Um, you know, we have. I don't think we've had students design automatic detectors. We are using by and large um, detectors that have been tried and true in our standard, but we do have um, students who have a chance to explore using code for other, other small projects um, in, in like creating their own figures or, or doing some of the statistical analysis of the, the results. Um, so yeah, we've dabbled in that a little bit. Um, you know, the, the research we do is so interdisciplinary. You can pull in computer science and physics and math and biology. And Amaya has to take off. See ya, see ya Amaya. She has she has a job to go to. Um, and and so yeah, there are definitely opportunities, and the students are are more than capable of of taking on coding projects as part of this research. Yeah, I can actually speak to my experience. Um, it wasn't during high school, but in in college, I did do some statistical analysis to quantify the correlation between uh, the bowhead whale calls, the presence of bowhead whale calls and the movement of sea ice. So that, that was my personal experience with coding related to this field. We have another question uh, coming in from Tina who wants to know what the requirements to enter into the program are. So Mr. Mahoney, maybe you can talk about that process of students coming into your classroom. Yeah, well, we like to provide uh, opportunities to as many students as possible. So uh, initially we had an oceanography class that was a prerequisite to get into SeaTech, but uh, we also have marine biology here, and so we had kind of a duplication of marine science, and so the administration said we needed to kind of pick and choose. But so what we, we've done is we've just created a situation where students can take physical and earth science and uh, biology, and then that's uh, sufficient enough for them to come in and uh, work with us in SeaTech. 
Great. And um, and I'm not sure if you also want to add, uh, are there any requirements on the mentor and instructor side of how to get involved in CTEC? I don't think that we have um, standardized requirements for mentors to become involved, but we really are careful about who we invite to be a mentor. We want somebody who is going to be committed to meeting with the students who is definitely invested in their science learning and in supporting them. Um, and, and ideally, the mentor has research that overlaps with the projects that the students will be doing. Um, it's a lot easier to motivate a mentor to work with the students if the students are actively contributing to their work. Um, you know, we work together. Um, but it's, it's more, yeah, that we don't, we don't have solid, like I said before, we have undergrads, grads, staff, and faculty. We have a variety of different researchers who have been mentors. I, I think also uh, it's, it's a, a special relationship that we have with these, these researchers who already have 40 hours, 60 hour a week jobs that they're doing on their own and they're donating their time. And that's, that's part of the relationship is that you have to find mentors that are willing to work with high school students and, and a teacher who doesn't necessarily know how to code in MATLAB and hasn't, hasn't used all the equipment before. Uh, but it, it's just, it's absolutely amazing the amount of time that, that Anne and Josh and Natalie and, and all of the researchers that we've had working with our students hours a week. Uh, on top of what they already do. And it, it, it's, it's so rewarding. It's a lot of fun. Thank you. So I think because it is a lot of fun and you have shown that in your presentation, we have had quite a number of questions come in about how to get involved. So um, one question from Veronica is, can graduate students studying acoustics get involved as teachers or techs? And we also have a few questions um, from others in Europe and other schools, if there are ways to also join the CTEC program. I would direct that question to Josh. Do you want to answer that? Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. I, actually, I, I saw those uh, questions on the chat. And they were really making me want to very much finish my PhD so I can keep working on this <laughs> on this project. I think there are um, I think there are a lot of people who would like to participate in in something like this. And um, probably you know this the, the question is what do we do from here? You know it's a question for you Mahoney and a question for uh, you know Tessa and Chachi Ian and and Doreen and you know and everybody. What what, what, what can we do from here? And um, I, I suppose in my, in my dream, it would be um, that you don't need, it's not CTEC so much as it is sort of a way of being. It's a way of operating as a scientist and a way of operating as a science teacher. If you're disposed in this way to, to create opportunities and to share, um, then it's, it's ideally um, just a matter of finding that recipe. A teacher, an academic institution of higher learning, uh, marine science or whatever your science is and and some sort of glue to to stick together and just ask hey what can we do this year how can we get our students uh working together or all of our staff and and our our you know professor and whoever working together so and you know i i think that the probably the the next a, a neat next step for ctech would be more of this uh, you know discussion maybe broadening the discussion to include more people uh, who are trying to do the same thing. I think this would be a wonderful network um, of, of people to, to answer that question of what can we do next. And um, yeah, I would see, you know, with a bit of support, we could, we could make this something that other groups could do. And maybe this example could help to, to help to do that. Specifically, um, how can people get involved in CTEC as it is right now here? Um, well, everybody that we that we collaborate with, for example, in the Whale Acoustics Lab or, you know, Anne's collaborators. I'm sure that Anne, as, as we are, is always looking for people who are interested in working with, um, with students. And um, I know Mr. Mahoney's capacity is, it equals the number of students that he can somehow, you know, catch in his net every year, um, you know, through his very 
amazing selective process. Um, and so we may be somewhat limited there, but there's one teacher, you know, and we are, and we're, you know, we're one or two labs. So I guess I would, um, I'd say if you're really interested in participating with us, then just, you know, get in touch. Let's see if we can figure something out, a way to get students, you know, maybe one of Mr. Mahoney's students could work on something in Australia or something next year um, and so on. So, but we need if we could continue this discussion somehow. And I'll, I'll mute myself. <laughs> And we will be sharing the contact information of at least one of the team that has presented in our follow-up email so you can get in touch. And I think this is also a testament to uh, an opportunity for this research coordination network to put some of its own time to supporting how to democratize the incredible program that you have created and hopefully use this 500 person network uh, to spread the incredible tools and framework or mind of thinking, as you said, Josh, with as many people as possible to inspire this type of hands-on learning and growing of experts. Um, we have another question from David um, about how far can the hydrophones detect clear marine mammal sounds and what species can be heard from the greatest distance? Josh, maybe you and I can tag team this one. The detectability of any signal is gonna depend on a lot of factors. So there's, there's no constant here. It depends on you know, the temperature of the water, um, the, the physical oceanography that's present, the, the bottom type, if it's muddy or sandy or rocky, how deep the water is, if there's ice cover or not. Um, and then also the, what sound are we talking about? Lower frequency sounds from baleen whales can travel tens or hundreds of miles, where the high frequency clicks of, of dolphins or porpoises, you know, may only be detectable on ranges of tens or hundreds of meters. Um, and so, um, and then of course we have um, the underlying noise, ambient noise issues to worry about. In noisy conditions, you can detect things um, at shorter ranges. So on the range, I would say on the range of tens of meters to hundreds of, of kilometers, um, what species can be heard from the greatest distance? It would be one of our baleen whales for sure, um, probably blue whales, but in the Arctic. Josh, who do you think it would be that would be, you'd hear, you'd detect the furthest? We've got bowhead whales from, you know, 50, 60 kilometers, something like that. Yeah. So yeah, depending on what species it could be really far, or it could be, you know, like a beaked whale click or a high frequency click from a dolphin could be kilometer-ish, something much shorter. Then there's also the sound of Josh testing the hydrophone before he deploys it. I'm sure a very clear and marine mammal oriented sound. Yes, the students get to hear everything that we record with the instruments, including underwater sounds and the sounds on deck when the instruments are tested and deployed. So yeah, they're, 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 Mr. Mahoney can find, and the students can find all the interesting uh, signals in the, in the data. So we have another question um, from Tao in Mexico City, uh, and I'm going to ask Tao himself to come on um, and unmute himself. Uh, and ask his question. Thanks, Victoria. Um, hello, everybody. Thanks for the presentation. Um, yeah, my, my question is, uh, for example, I studied biology, and, and then now, now on I'm studying the master degree in oceanography and audits in law. So one of my dreams is to go to the Arctic and do some research with uh, mammals or, or fish uh in in that area so now that you are talking about all these kind of acoustics uh it's very interesting for me to know a little bit more uh if i can um if you can provide me with some email or a web page so that i can see your program or who to talk about uh, about this because you know it's a little bit difficult for someone that lives in the tropics 
suddenly go to the Arctic area. <laughs> Thank you. Is this another me, my answer? I think so. Okay, all right. Uh, yeah, hi, Tal. Um, I, th I think maybe the, the best and most efficient way to go would be, again, for me to finish my PhD, which I should <laughs> defend in you know a month or two, um, and then be free to, to, uh, to think about and talk about some more collaborations and whatnot. But um, since I'm, I'm most of the Arctic work that we do in our particular lab, and, um, but, I, but I'd say, I think there's a, um, uh, hopefully there'll be a contact list Victoria from from this and um, you know if you're really serious about getting involved in in Arctic research um, I think I suspect there probably be quite a few people you know at least some students and folks in the Arctic who would be interested in uh, participating in some you know tropical uh, subtropical uh, waters <laughs> research. so you know some yeah. a dream would be some kind of a, you know an exchange uh, of people whose whose home waters are separated by you know great great distances, but would have an interest in learning about maybe working across those kind of large boundaries. Okay, yeah. Does that work for now? <laughs> um, yeah, I think so, because uh, I used to work, well, let's say, like a small um, training, let's say that, uh, with, I don't know if you know, the these um, Jasco factory, the, the, the one that uh, studies all about this, this acoustic thing. So they were very interesting in me because I can, well, you know, biology can open you a lot of things in, in that area. But they told me that I need to have like a break and a little bit of more practice in acoustics. That's why I, I'm, I'm asking this because, you know, uh, well, maybe you know, maybe not, but Mexico is a little bit limited in that kind of, of engineering or or it's difficult to get involved in that area. So I'm trying to, you know, open doors so I, I, I've been working on that to work outside and especially in the Arctic. Yeah, well, Ted, just I, I'd encourage you to keep in touch, Tal, and, uh, and, and don't hesitate to also copy Anne, and uh, who a, has a big giant network of uh, people she's involved with in, in this field. So um, yeah, please do, please do follow up on that, it'd be nice. Okay, thank you very much. And thanks again for all the presentation. Yeah, thank you for that great question. And again, we will be sharing some contact information of our presenters in the follow-up email. And through this research coordination network, we will have opportunities to connect with other members in small group meetings in the fall in a Slack channel that you can message and find peer mentors and others to ask questions and go through this research journey together. Uh, and we hope to build that out over the next three years in our uh, currently young research coordination network, but hopefully a growing uh, international network that you can find support in. Um, so we have another question from Bronte in Iceland. Do you think there is a key marine species in the Arctic or in Alaska that needs more research to look at how increasing shipping noise could be impacting them? Go, Josh. Uh, this is me again. <laughs> I, uh... I, I, I re really don't want to um, be the, the one talking the most here. I'm going to try a really brief answer, but I, this is the subject of my, my dissertation research, and, um, and so I'm, I might be a, a good candidate. Anyway, I, I, they, right now in the, um, just briefly, in the Canadian Arctic and the Alaskan Arctic, that's where we work, um, one of the primary um, concerns, as you sounds like you know, is increasing shipping activities, increasing navigability and duration of open water season. Um, and so the, the species that seem um, to be of highest concern, particularly to people, again, whose home waters these animals live in, um, are uh, ring seals and bearded seals and uh, belugas and narwhals. These are, these are subsistence species. Um, that uh, people really depend upon for, for hunting and for food. And they also, um, each, each species has, has shown some, um, 
especially with the, the Belugas and Narwhals, kind of have shown some sensitivity to uh, shipping in terms of observed, published behavioral responses in the presence of ships. And, and that's something that we're really working on um, in the Northeastern Canadian Arctic, where there's a lot of increased shipping because of um, uh, new mine, um, iron ore mine development up there. Um, but there's a real concern about um, ice breaking and the uh, stability of sea ice for uh, ring seals and, and bearded seals uh, too. I'm sure that you know each species has there's a concern there, um, but those are four that that come to mind. Great, thank you, Josh. And hopefully, this is a good uh, you know preview for what your PhD defense will be in a couple of weeks. Uh, so we have about 10 minutes left, and if anyone has any further questions, please put them in the chat. Uh, I'm going to ask one that came in last week from social media, and I think this is more for the students and uh, Mr. Mahoney, and it's about how to uh, build out a program like CTEC. So this is from an educator in the lower 48. I really want to engage my students with hands-on science and experts from universities, but it's hard to find who to contact and how to build out a program that's meaningful for my high schoolers. What can I do to create a program that connects with those researchers and how do I reach out to researchers at universities? Wow, that's, that's a tough question. Uh, we, were, we were pretty fortunate when the, the institution found us. Um, it, I, I think it would be pretty rare to just have, you know, the Scripps Whale Acoustics Lab call you and say, hey, do you want to work together? Uh, I, I think it's important to create connections and uh, to, to meet with whatever scientific institution is, is near you or that you're interested in working with. And, and try to build a relationship with them uh, and, and be uh, interested in, in what it is that they're trying to achieve and seeing how you might be able to get your students to, to help them achieve those goals. Uh, and, and then you build that relationship over time. Uh, I think the, initially when, when Josh and I started this, this program you know, 12 years ago, we were doing it a hundred percent outside of our normal class day. We were, you know, or our job. Uh, I was scanning data at home. My wife was thinking I was crazy. <laughs> but uh, I think it really just to to make something like CTEC happen, you need. There are a lot of pieces that you have to have. One, you have to have a scientific institution that's willing to share. Uh, to have somebody like Dr. Hildebrand that's willing to share data is just is a phenomenal thing to find because a, a lot of people are very protective of their data. Um, to have a researcher that has the time and the, the desire to work directly with high school students, even if it's just an hour a week, uh, it can, can be a challenge to find that person. And then also to find the teacher that's willing to put in that time on top of their already busy schedule. Uh, and, and then lastly, to find an administration that's as flexible as ours that allows them to, you know, to bring it into the day. So I no longer have to do CTEC on my own time. I have, you know, an administration that's allowed me to bring it in as a class that we teach that that's kind of outside of the normal curriculum for, for you know, whatever state standards you might have. And I might just add, build on to that a little bit. Um, beyond going directly to universities to try and find willing partners. Um, another, another sort of model that I use is I work with the San Diego County of, of Education, so with the school district. There might be um, opportunities or programs where they're connecting university researchers with teachers, maybe that you're not aware of, um, and, and they might be another resource that could help bridge that, that partnership. I think there's, uh, I could add one more, uh, one more really potential um, uh, helpful resource, and that is your local informal science education facility, be it a museum of science or a marine science institute or an outdoor natural science education school. Those, those um, organizations are 
just by their design are trying to connect students with and teachers with hands-on actual you know work and research and those organizations like for in our case it was the ocean institute in dana point um, and we have the birch aquarium at scripps um, the aquarium of the pacific in long beach they've all been really um, happy to hear from us and have put their education departments um, right to work in trying to find a way to connect us with students and teachers they work with so another conduit um, you know maybe a Maybe helpful. I also have something to add quickly. I put it in the chat, but another partnership um, that might be valuable, well, I think would be valuable is to connect with local subsistence boards um, and agencies like the Inuit Circumpolar Council that does a lot of work around the marine mammals that you all do research on too. Um, you know, one of the biggest issues um, that I find in rural Alaska is food security. And that, that has a lot to do with the marine mammals that um, we have talked about today. So I think you know, being able to bridge that gap between traditional knowledge holders and researchers, I think would be a very valuable place to start. Thank you. I think all of those are excellent entry points to building those meaningful relationships with students, with researchers, with traditional and indigenous knowledge holders, and with local networks, right? Because it is always better to work as a team. And I'm not just saying that because I'm heading up this network and I hope to work with all of you in the future. Um, so we are at five minutes to go. Um, and I don't see any other questions in the chat. So maybe I will ask one final question that we got uh, on social media and then wrap up our webinar. So this is for the student researchers. What was the best part of the C-TECH program and how has that helped you in what you're doing after high school? I think the best part was going to San Diego and also presenting in, in front of all of the grad students and PIs. That was scary, but it was also really fun afterwards, knowing that you, fat, you did all this research for months and then you go to San Diego, have a little bit of fun, and then you do this big presentation that you probably dreaded for the whole semester. <laughs> All right, I'll, I'll go next. Uh, yeah, one, one of the most incredible experiences I had was, yeah, also going to San Diego, but I, I also got the opportunity to go on a week long um, like a boat expedition and we went out into the middle of the ocean and yeah that was just an incredible experience and that's really what inspired me to go into engineering and so, so yeah that, that was a really cool experience and totally shaped my career i could add a little bit i think um I think the biggest impact that CTEC has had in my life was just being able to, you know, carry on my education in San Diego at UC San Diego and have these partnerships and the support that I needed to actually complete college. So I think this is a really good, meaningful program that actually has the best intentions um, of its students and scientists. So. All right. Any, I think our last student alumni has left, so that might be all of them. And I think that is a pretty inspirational way to end this webinar. So I want to invite everyone to again, join me in a huge virtual round of applause for our incredible team of presenters here. Thank you so much for sharing your story, your expertise on whale acoustics, and your experience, and what we can all do to be better in this realm of 
research, of outreach, of education, and hopefully this is a conversation that is just starting and will continue on through this network and the connections that we have made here. As a reminder, um, you will be getting an email later this week with the recorded link from this webinar that will be uploaded onto YouTube for those of you who might have come a bit late. You will also get contact information for the CTEC team and a link to join our research coordination network if you have not yet so that you can join us in person with travel stipends to Alaska, to Sweden, and here to Washington DC in the years to come to continue to build these friendships and relationships that we've started today. Um, and while this was an incredible webinar, uh, it is only our fifth in 11 that we have coming up this year. We have great presentations on cultural heritage and climate change, on thawing permafrost, on how educators can make those connections to um, researchers and traditional knowledge holders. And we have our next one next Wednesday, August 26th at 12 p.m. Eastern time on Arctic fisheries from Svalbard, where Andreas Ostagen will be presenting his research from Svalbard in Norway. So I hope that you will all join us next week for that webinar. You can register in the follow-up link. Thank you again so much for spending the last hour and a half with us. And I hope you all have a wonderful week that is off to an inspiring start from these researchers that we have learned from today. So thank you all again, and I look forward to seeing you next time.